Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Congregational Church of Global Pandemics. Extreme beauty and reasonably mediocre sermons. That's what we're famous for. Oh, and if anybody comes up with an invention of how to wear a face mask without steaming up your glasses, well, forget about the face mask. Forget about the gloves. You know, let's, let's start with a little, little prayer, short one. Loving God, on this beautiful Sunday morning, we ask that you deliver us from evil. And while you're at it, please deliver us from stupidity. Please deliver us from extreme selfishness. Because there's a spirit in us that wants to live, and there's clearly a spirit in us that thinks that it's okay for other people to die in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, 40s to defend our right to walk our dogs in the park on a sunny Sunday afternoon, by golly, and I demand that the bowling alleys and the hamburger stands and the, 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 the local breweries open up again so I can exercise my patriotic duty to do whatever I want. There is a spirit in us like that. Lord, deliver me from my own anger. Help us to be in covenant with each other as we proceed through what nobody wants to be going through, but which the world has gone through time and time and time again, where we have felt free to ignore it when it was in Africa. Ebola killing countless people. AIDS in Africa, immobilizing the armies of some nations. And now it's our turn, apparently. Help us to be a model for the next generation after generation after generation of, of how to respond as a people under the guidance of a loving God who we may understand or not, who will lead us forth into health and hope and healing. Loving God, you did not create this universe, and it was good, and it was good, and he created this, and it was good, and that one was good, and that was good, and then on the seventh day, he rested exhausted from doing all that goodness for us so that we can turn around and be indifferent to it. Deliver us from ourselves, and deliver us into your grace and glory. Amen. Well, I'm so happy I got that off my chest. I feel about 1% better. 20 more of those today, and we'll be doing great. But you know what will help a lot? It's if we get right into some music. This is the beginning of a seven-week series on the Apostle Paul. You'll learn a lot about him today and in subsequent weeks. But do, does anybody like, uh, do you guys like Bob Marley? We're at a church of three today. Craig, Craig Kathleen, do you guys like Bob Marley? Yeah? yeah? Everybody likes Bob Marley, right? Every, I, I hope so. Well, Rastafarian and did a song that was based on, guess what? The words of the Apostle Paul, who was talking about Jesus Christ, who had been rejected. Obviously, crucifixion is a form of a rejection, wouldn't you say? The stone that the builder rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That was Jesus the Christ that Bob Marley was talking about trans or pantheism and religion and all that stuff from Rastafarian to Christian to whoever. Now let's hear a song, another version of countless versions of the stone that the builder rejected or the stone that the builder refused based on the words of Apostle Paul as Kathleen Gubitosi comes in to start us off on a sweeter, nicer tone than your loving pastor did. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, feeling better, feeling better. I'm going to get this out of the way. You can see that the sanctuary is empty. I've said this before. We've been closed for almost two months already, or it is two months, and we're going to be closed for a while longer. Uh, but guess what? Not everybody knows it, but you might as well. We are keeping our staff on payroll. We think it is the moral imperative not to say, oh, we're hurting financially, you're done, but to say, okay, custodian who's in your 60s with a husband who's recovering from cancer at home, we're going to keep paying you. Okay, young custodian with two young children and a wife at home, we're going to keep paying you. Okay, nursery attendant who wipes the butts of children whose parents she doesn't know the last name of, we'll keep you in your late 70s working three hours a week in a nursery. We're going to keep paying you. And she said, thank God and thank you. So we're going to keep doing that. And we can do it with your help. Get this out of the way. We can't do it on Facebook right now. There's no donate button. We're trying to get it. Go to the church's website, Church on Main Street, all spelled out, S-T-R-E-E-T, -E churchonmainstreet.org. There's a donate button in the right-hand corner that'll help us keep going here and building up our pantry and stuff when we get back into the saddle and uh, continue doing things uh, as in a modified version of what we used to do. Okay, the Apostle Paul is what we call him now. Once upon a time, this guy named Saul, not Paul, but Saul, he was a devout Jew and a Roman citizen. So some people think that the Jews were all persecuted in, in Jerusalem by the Romans, and that's obviously true, occupation, etc. But Paul was both a Jew and a Roman citizen. And he was a devout Jew. He knew Greek, he knew Greek philosophy, and he believed that the people who were following Jesus were screwing up Judaism and needed to be wiped out to deal with a cleansing act on this renegade bunch of ne'er-do-wells who call themselves Christians or followers of the way. Get them out of the way and let's get back to Judaism like it used to be in the good old days before this Jesus guy who we thought we got rid of and we crucified him. What else do we need to do? Get him out of the way. So Saul got authority to go and persecute Christians. And he did. He was on his horse on a road to Damascus with that in mind when all of a sudden he had a, a confrontation with the divine. And it was a blinding light, blinded by the light, set up like a goose, and to roll in, whatever that song lyric is. You know, there's thousands of things, blinded by the light. This is where it comes from. Just knocked off his horse, blinded for three days. And while he's in this state, Jesus, Jesus, who's been dead for 35 to 50 years, comes up and says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so what he does then, while blinded, he becomes dependent on the people he was trying to persecute. Can you imagine I'm running around hunting down the Taliban and I get blinded and they, take, they nurse me back to health? It was ridiculous. And they helped him go to the bathroom. He got over here. Here, here's a bowl of hot soup. Don't burn your fingers. It's about six inches in front of your right hand. Okay, here you go. Here's a change of clothes. Here's a pillow. And after three days of being nursed and loved by the people he was trying to persecute and others, he became a follower of Jesus and changed his name after his conversion experience from Saul to Paul. And then he did what any good musician like Bob Marley would do. He took the good news. He took the show on the road. Jesus, the nice rabbi who probably never lived, ventured further than 50 miles from his birthplace, very different than Saul, who was not talking only to Jews now because he was saying, this news is so good, it needs to be shared with the world. It needs to be shared with blues guitarists, um, slumlords, or whoever it is. Christians, non-Christians, Jews, Buddhists, Sikhs, Unitarians, Muslims, whoever it is, let's talk about this good news. Maybe they have good news to teach us also. And some people are saying, wait a minute, we understand bringing in like slumlords, but blues guitarists? Oh, no, 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 we have to draw the line somewhere. So he took it on the road and Paul traveled visiting fledgling, often deeply troubled churches, like there are to this very day, of course, in various cities, taking that good news to Jews and non-Jews alike. Fortunately, 
he corresponded with letters. He would write letters from the churches or to the churches, and some of these letters remain to this day. By the way, the influence of Paul is already felt right here. We're singing a Bob Marley song in a church. We've got a Star of David above our window. So the whole message of Paul of inclusivity, welcoming people. We have a Jewish member of the Christian church who never got baptized, never renounced Judaism. She's Jewish, and she's a member of the Christian church, the Congregational Church of Patchak. Fine. Jews in the choir. This, a lot of this is the outgrowth of the, the ministry of Paul over 2,000 years ago. So Paul wrote these letters. And he wrote Ephesians, which were written about Ephesus, Romans about, guess where, Rome, uh, First and Second Corinthians from about to and from and about Corinth, etc. And then, in an irony of ironies, Paul, who started out persecuting Christians, was imprisoned, tortured, killed, and eventually sainted by the Catholic Church for his devotion to Jesus the Christ, to Christians whom he had once persecuted. And if you go to the Vatican today, which nobody does because it's like quarantined, um, you stand, I've done it myself several times, stand and you look at this a magnificent place, the Vatican, the Basilica, and there's two huge uh, statues. One is of Peter, St. Peter, the first pope of the church. And Jesus said about Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. And the other is Paul, who came along 35 or 50 years after Jesus. And it's like, wow, there they are, the two pillars of the church. And when he went to the churches, he did interesting stuff, dealing with church problems like we have every day in some place. And some we don't. For example, you can read it. It's in the Bible. And it's in the Pauline letters. Um, there's this man who's dating this woman. So they always sit together. And they break up. So the man's son starts dating his father's ex-girlfriend. And they write a letter to Paul. Would you please solve this for us? Thank God they didn't write a letter to Pastor Dwight. I am... Uh, what do you do with that? Yeah, the son is dating the ex-girlfriend of his father, and no, nobody's happy, and it's kind of disrupting our praise and worship service here. Yeah, I bet it is. So Paul did all these different problems, thankless job, unpaid, until eventually he started taking the paycheck. But despite all of his good works, he was not broadly accepted. For one thing, he's arrived, like I said, many years after the crucifixion and was looked at as a Johnny-come-lately showing up, you know, we do all the work and you come in and grab all the fame. No, 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 no. And he had various views on communion, worship, money, rites, and doctrines of the church, such as circumcision. Aren't you glad, a little after 10 in the morning, Pastor Dwight's going to talk about circumcision. Ha-ha, <laughs> here we go. One of the things is that you, the, the mark of the covenant would be circumcised. And then Paul said, no, 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 no. He said, just imagine, somebody comes in and they're 30 years old, they want to join the church, and you say, yeah, you, your brother, your brother-in-law, your children, your field workers, all the boys, you can join the church, but all of y'all have to get circumcised first. And don't forget to put some money in the basket because we need to help the widows and orphans. It's like, what? Are you kidding me? And Paul would say, get rid of that stuff. It doesn't matter. The, the market of covenant is what people are going to do, what they believe, how they treat each other, not what you do with your, you know, what. And so um, that's for or against. This is Paul's position, not mine. Have you had enough about circumcision? I have. To this day, 2,000 years have passed, and despite being sainted by the Catholic Church, and despite being the world's most famous evangelist, because he took the Christianity out into the world in ways that Jesus never did, and despite having been martyred for his faith, being executed rather than renounce his beliefs, he remains a man who is difficult to love. For example, the Paul who wrote the words, the stone that the builder has rejected has become the chief cornerstone, songs about love, words about the, that countless millions, perhaps your marriage included. And in the end, 
There are three things that last forever, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. That was written by Paul. Everybody loves it. And he said, without love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. He's the same Paul who said, okay, women, hold on to your seats. Don't blame me. I didn't write this. It was 2,000 years ago also. That saved love, 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 love. Chief Cornerstone Paul also wrote, women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate. If there's anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Now, if you really don't like me, just edit out what I just said and act like that was my entire sermon. Women should not be allowed to speak in the church. The women, churches are run by women, have been for thousands of years, still are. It's ridiculous. But it's the same guy. So as you might suspect, then and now, Paul's words remain dubious to some. And Paul himself remains dubious to some. Many women, of course, and men, are offended by Paul instructing women to remain silent in church. Others prefer to focus on how they appreciate Paul for what he has done for their personal faith. Yes, Jesus is the cornerstone, and I will not reject him. I will build my faith upon that cornerstone. And I will build my faith upon the rock of St. Peter. Now, we're not a Catholic church. We're a Protestant church, but that doesn't matter. We're talking about faith here. There's no denying that there's plenty of harsh words and teachings throughout his letters. As we proceed through these seven weeks of contemplation upon the Pauline letters, the letters written by Paul, rather than defending or rebuking them, saying that we reject and won't hear all the good things he said and did because we focus on the things he said about women, which are very upsetting to me as well. We're going to look at the totality of the person. Something that, does that very happen? You know, we're, we're in a political environment where we dig up dirt 20, 30 years ago that somebody said and try to nail them to the cross for something they said 30 years ago. Lord, forgive me, and I'll just retire today if you find out what I said 30 years ago. I don't know. I don't want to know, let alone be held accountable as if I'm the same person. And 2,000 years have passed. But we'll see. So try to take on the difficult task, as we do in the church all the time, of reconciling the parts of Paul you love and the parts of Paul you find offensive. And in the meantime, you just may learn how to reconcile the parts of yourself you love and the parts of yourself that you find offensive. Parts of Reverend Dwight Lee Walters sicken me. I can't get rid of them. I've been trying for years. But I've got to love myself nonetheless. I can, I can see beyond my faults, as God can see beyond my faults, to see my deepest needs. Coming to believe that Paul was a bit unusual, I wrote my Master Divinity thesis on the Apostle Paul and um, the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill Wilson, and the psychiatrist, Carl Jung. I combined three of them as highly unlikely people. What kind of, if God is a fake construct that we use to heal our pain or the opiate of the people or something, what kind of God, who would create a God that has an alcoholic, womanizing stockbroker, uh, uh, a quite crazy polygamist psychiatrist, and um, a persecutor of Christians who blew off women in the church and say, yeah, I'm going to give my message through you. Additionally, we only have a handful of these letters. Imagine if I picked up seven ran random pieces of paper that you'd written. One's a grocery list during a pandemic. Another is a breakup letter to the loser who you no longer, who dumped you. Another one is this pleading thing that you wrote from your bed when you were desperately ill or a letter to you, someone who had de uh, de deceased. Or on the occasion of the birth of a child, I wrote something called birth poem about my daughter Celeste. Uh, it would be nice to be remembered by that. I would not necessarily want to 
be remembered by this sermon or whatever. So we have seven random pieces of paper. Those are the authentic letters of Paul that we'll be studying in the next seven weeks. So despite all his controversy, Paul has become the single most recognized voice in Christianity. Above any of the original apostles we associate with Jesus, Paul has changed the course of history and the shape of humanity, even infiltrating reggae music to this very day. Thank God that the living Christ reached down and touched the life of the Apostle Paul by saying, why, why are you picking on love and forgiveness, man? What's the matter with you? It's not good enough that I'm dead? What, now you, you've got to stamp out the gospel message of peace, reconciliation, loving your enemies, delivering us from evil? And if Christ can reach down and touch the life of Paul, the persecutor of Christians, guess what? Jesus the Christ, God, higher power, Yahweh, Allah, whoever can certainly reach down and touch your life and transform you no matter how and no matter what you are or what you have done. God, Christ, looks beyond your faults to see your deepest needs to heal your wounds, to see your gifts. God saw the gifts of Bill Wilson, an alcoholic, womanizing stockbroker, cheating on his partners, and said, I can use you to save millions of people who suffer from the disease of addiction like you do can reach down to Paul and say, Paul, just shut up about women and stuff for a minute, would you? Because you you know, you have such passion. If I can turn you on the right course and get off this narcissistic, self-destructive, arrogant path where it's my way or the highway, and if you get in my way, even a pandemic, you get in my way, you're going down, man, because I deserve to eat a hamburger and have a beer. And you can die for it. Thank you very much. I didn't ask you to, but, you know, go ahead. But now... The park is clear, and I'm back walking my dog. If, if God can reach down and touch people like that and say, why don't you think about the child in the stroller that you're walking past? Why don't you think about this? Oh, yeah, because your passion, even your anger, even your arrogance can be turned in a different direction. And I can use you to heal a world in a pandemic that is terrified. Let's use the terror. Let's use the time of isolation. Not to drink ourselves to sleep and watch and binge on Netflix until it goes away, because it never goes away. It, fear, this just percolates up anywhere else. It's part of our life. But we can be a model, like Paul, on how to help the world. So that when people look back on us, this church was founded in 1758. Nothing like this has happened. Nothing has closed this church for two, three months. Nothing ever since 1758. That is a threat. That is a fear that might close this church. It will close, by latest guess in this denomination, 50 churches in the state of New York alone within the next nine months. But you know what? It's also a blessing that God trusts us, that we're alive at this time so that we can be a source of help and hope and healing, reaching beyond ourselves, resetting, pray God, the course of humanity, and say, you know what? I enjoy this clean air. You know what? I enjoy that the neighbors across the street I've known for 13 years are waving at me as they sit on the front porch, grateful for a day that's not ringing and they're not wearing a mask for a couple minutes. And then they go back inside and say, yeah, let's keep the fresh air going. Let's keep this stuff going. Yes, the world is going to be different. And you know what? It's large part up to us. It'll be better. And as this virus sweeps down into sub, uh, Af sub-Saharan Africa, and it is, and if we happen to be able to get our beer and our cheeseburger and watching the, the pretty people in the park and walking our dogs back, pray God 
we remain in covenant with them because Africa very well might be decimated. They got one ventilator in one country. Pray God we can ship everything over there and try to help them. One world. We are the world. Everybody laughs at it. We are the world. We are. This is a sickening song, you know, but isn't it true? We have been equalized. We have been made to kneel out, get down on our knees in humility and say we have no cure for what we're up against. We have no filter between us and fear and panic. We are falling into hopelessness and we have no faith, many of us, to sustain us in times of trouble. But you do here. You do now. Partially through the guidance of the Apostle Paul. You, too, can get back on your horse after COVID-19 has knocked you off your horse and you're blinded for three days, stumbling around not knowing who you are or what to do or if you're going to live, and set you off in an entirely new direction of life with the Apostle Paul, God, and Jesus the Christ as your guides. May God bless you and keep you safe, happy, and spiritually inspired. I didn't feel like this when I woke up, but I feel it now. I feel some spirit whipping through me that has lifted me up. Pray God it'll last more than five minutes after this is over because we're all socially distanced. I'm hoping Craig doesn't have something that kills me, and he's hoping I don't have something that kills him, etc. We're in service to you. It's a small price to pay. What price will you pay? Because it'll help us journey forward. Next week, we go into the letter to the Romans. If you're a Bible person, go into the letter to the Romans. Read Romans. It's really interesting. The thing he says in there, the things that I want to do, I don't do, Paul says this. The things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. What is this? He's this inner conflict. He freely admits it. And is the Apostle Paul. Maybe we can freely admit our pain and suffering and doubt in a time like this, and be made stronger for it. Now, if you care to join, let us pray the prayer that when the original disciple said to Jesus, so what is this prayer you're talking about? How do we pray? He says, hey, hey, pray it like this, and use whatever words with which you may be most familiar. I encourage you to pray it aloud, and if uh, you don't indulge in this kind of thing, then just um, eat pretzels. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. One more song based on, you wouldn't believe it, this is another song based on the words of Paul. I counted in the hymnal, one of the hymnals I used, 283 hymns were based on the words of Paul. Interesting dude to say the least. Craig, are you ready to sing uh, The Gift of Love for us? Very good. Okay, get over to the piano, unless you want me to carry you in the sedan chair. This guy's uh, perks are unbelievable. And we'll see you in a moment. Though I may speak with bravest fire and have the gift to all inspire and have not love my words are vain as sounding brass and hopeless gain Prophet. 
would soon turn strangely thin. Come, Spirit, come, our hearts control, our spirits long to be This is the first time I haven't been really anxious to get out of here because I was afraid of getting sick. <laughs> uh, you know, coming in here and trying to pull this off and then leaving safely, staying healthy for another week or two, then we'll know that we're in the safe zone again, only to come back and do it again. But it's our honor to do this, and I hope um, it has pleased your heart. And uh, I know times are rough for you too, so I remind you that if it be your will, the, uh, go to uh, churchonmainstreet.org, Congregational Church of Patchogue. Hit the donate button to help us get through this, and we will do our best to help you and other parts of the community to get through this as well. Join us again next week for the Apostle Paul, uh, uh, the book of uh, letter Romans, letter to Romans. Read it. Really interesting stuff. And if you don't read it, come back anyway. We'll, we'll unpack it for you. If you desire, we have a Zoom uh, class on the Apostle Paul, but we don't open it because of Zoom bombing. It's gotten ugly. I've been in a couple of Zoom bomb meetings, and it's really, really ugly. Uh, so I ask you to send me an email. It's my name, Dwight Lee Walter, W-O-L-T-E-R, Dwight Lee Walter at gmail.com, and let me know that you'd like to join, and I can send you an invitation. So until we meet again, God willing, health willing, pandemic willing, we'll see you again t next Sunday morning at 10. And until then, may the light of God shine down upon you. May the light of God shine out from within you and bring you and those whose lives you touch a sustainable amount of mercy and peace. Peace.